In this tutorial we're going to model a plunger and create a render similar to this one. A plunger may seem like a strange subject, but it's easy to model and it can help you learn many basic techniques which you can use to create your own stuff. A few notes before we start. This is a beginner tutorial, but you would probably do a lot better if you have at least a basic understanding of Blender interface and 3D modeling terminology. If you don't, there are plenty of absolute beginner tutorials on YouTube that can teach you that stuff. Also, to follow along with this particular tutorial, you'll need a keyboard with a numpad. I strongly believe that keyboard shortcuts are a key to modeling in Blender. They really turn it into an extension of your mind, and the sooner you learn them, the less frustration you're going to experience. I will be announcing the keys I'm pressing, and you'll also see them in the bottom right corner of my screen. So here I am in a new Blender file, and the first thing I'm going to do is box select the default objects and press delete. I'm going to use a cylinder as the base of our model. To create a cylinder, I'm going to press Shift A and under Mesh select Cylinder. Now before I click anything else, I'm going to go to this menu which appeared when I created the cylinder and under Vertices type in 16. Next I'm going to cut my cylinder in half. To do that I'm going to tab into the Edit mode, press Ctrl R to create a loop cut, followed by a left mouse button click to apply it and then a right click to keep the cut exactly in the middle of my cylinder. Next, holding down Alt, I'm going to click on one of the vertices at the base of my cylinder. This will loop select all of the base vertices, followed by deleting those vertices. I now have the base for the cup of my plunger, and I'm ready to add more details. Let's work on the part where the cup of the plunger connects to the handle. We'll switch to face edit mode by pressing 3 on the keyboard, select the top face, and press I to insert it to around this size. I will then press E to extrude the selection upwards, followed by another inset and another extrude, this time down along the z-axis. Now let's press 2 to switch to edge select mode, hold down Alt and click anywhere along this edge to loop select it. I'm going to smooth it out with the bevel tool, Control B, and scroll my mouse wheel up to add segments for an even smoother shape. And now you can see the plunger cup shape starting to emerge. Let's give our plunger cup some volume. For that I'm going to tab into the edit mode, press 3 to edit faces, hold down Alt and press on an edge between two faces like so. In fact, let me show you a different selection method which I find really useful. First I'll clear my current selection by clicking outside of the model, then Alt click on an edge between two faces like so. And now I can just press Ctrl Numpad Plus to expand my selection. I'll keep doing it until everything but the part that sticks out is selected. For the next few steps I'm going to switch to front view by pressing Numpad 1 and then to wireframe mode by pressing Z and selecting wireframe. I will now duplicate and scale the selected faces to create the inner volume of the cup of my plunger. So first Shift D to duplicate and right click to keep the copy in place and then S to scale the copy to create the inner volume. Now after scaling my inner volume, I'm noticing that it's not properly aligned at the bottom with my outer volume. To fix that, I'm going to Ctrl Z undo the scale, choose 3D cursor as my pivot point, and press S again to redo the scaling operation. Now the inner and outer volumes are properly aligned. Let's press Z to switch back to solid shading mode, and turn the model to have a better view of the underside. I'm going to press 2 to switch to edge select mode, Select corresponding edges of the inner and outer volumes and press F to create a face. I will then select an open edge of the new face and keep pressing F until the gap between the inner and the outer volumes is filled. We still have a hole left at the top of the inner volume, so I'm going to alt click the edge of that hole and press F to cap it with a new face. And here's the completed cup of our plunger. And now that the cup is finished, let's add a handle. I'm going to tab into the edit mode, select the face in the center, and extrude it up along the z-axis. Now I'm noticing that the handle is a bit too thick. To fix that, with the top face of the handle still selected, I will hold down Ctrl and Press numpad plus until the selection reaches the top of the cup. Press S to scale, 
and since I don't want to change the height of the handle, I will press Shift Z to exclude the Z axis from scaling. At this point, I'm pretty happy with the overall proportions. Now, I'm no plunger expert, but as far as I know, most plungers have this lip along the bottom of the cup. Ours will not be an exception. I'm going to tab into the edit mode and create a horizontal loop cut with Ctrl R. Then after switching to face select mode with 3, I'm going to alt click this edge over here to select a ring of faces along the bottom of the cup. And with this ring selected, I'm going to press alt E and select extrude edges along normals. This will allow me to extrude faces evenly from the center of the cup and my lip is ready. At this point the plunger looks pretty much complete, but it has this low poly look. Let's address that and uh, add a couple of more finishing touches before we can call it done. The first thing I'm going to do is right click on it in object mode and select shade smooth. It did make the cup look a lot smoother, but it gave the handle those weird artifacts. We're going to address that by going to the modifiers tab and selecting the subdivision surface modifier. This modifier makes the mesh more dense and therefore looking a lot smoother, but it did create an obvious issue. To fix that we need to add something that's often called supporting geometry. Let's temporarily disable the modifier, tab into edit mode, switch to face selection mode by pressing 3 and select the top face. Let's press Ctrl B to bevel the edge and scroll the mouse wheel up to add a couple of segments. This will create denser geometry around the problem areas to prevent them from collapsing. Let's re-enable subdivision surface and look at the result. That's definitely much better. There are a few more edges that I would like to be a bit sharper, so I'm going to temporarily disable my subdivision surface modifier and go over those two. I will fix them the same way that I fixed the handle, so I'm not going to comment each step individually. Having added all the bevels, I'm going to re-enable subdivision surface and inspect the result. I'm also going to make sure that subdivision levels in the viewport matches that of the render. Before I can call my model complete, I'm going to look at it from every angle. And sure enough, there's a weird looking piece. Sometimes when we create new geometry, Blender doesn't know whether it's facing inwards or outwards. And in such cases, we need to be specific. I'm going to enter edit mode, press A to select all geometry, Alt N to bring up the normals menu, and choose recalculate outside. At this point, I'm satisfied with the model, so I'm going to call it complete. With model incomplete, let's work on the presentation of our plunger, but I'm going to start with a couple of housekeeping tasks. First, I'm going to set the dimensions of our model closer to those of a real plunger. It is not as important in our case, but if you do decide to use the model in things like physics simulations, it's going to matter. So for the sake of good practice, let's do it. Just like before, I'm going to press S on the keyboard and start scaling the plunger. When the Z size gets close to 1 meter, I'm going to hold down Shift to decrease the speed and increase precision. I want the height of my plunger to be 1 meter, which is close enough to the real thing. Then I'm going to press dot on the numpad, which is going to refocus our viewport. Finally, I'm going to press Ctrl A on the keyboard and apply the scale. This is not strictly necessary in our case, but it helps avoid potential problems with things like modifiers in physics. And since our cylinder now deserves to be called a plunger, I'm going to name it accordingly. With this out of the way, let's start setting up our render. I want my final image to be a square, so in the Output Properties tab, I'm going to set the X resolution to 1080 pixels. It is time to set up a virtual camera for our render, so I'm going to start by setting up a new viewport for it. And after resizing my existing viewports, I'm going to drag up this little rounded corner over here. This will create a brand new viewport. Now all I have to do is change its type to 3D viewport. I do it to always know what my camera sees, 
even as I pan around my object in the main viewport. Now let's create the actual camera. I'm gonna switch to front view by pressing numpad 1, then press shift A and select camera. Now with my mouse over the new camera viewport, I'm gonna press numpad 0 on the keyboard. This will switch the viewport to the view from the camera. What you're seeing is the inside of the cup of the plunger. This is not particularly useful, so I'm just going to reposition the camera. With the camera selected, I'm going to press G for Move tool and Y to limit the movement to the Y axis. When I'm happy with the Y position, I'm going to press G and then Z to move the camera up. I'm going to repeat it a few times until I'm happy with what I'm seeing in the camera view. Now let's create a stage, or a light box if you will, for our plunger. First I'm going to press Shift A and create a plane. Then I'm going to scale it on the X axis to make sure that the edges are never visible in the camera. Next I'm going to tab into the edit mode and press 2 for edge select mode. I will select the rear edge and uh, press E and Z to extrude it upwards. Then we'll move the edge further back on the Y axis. And finally bevel the fold, adding a few segments for smoothness. I will then tab out of the edit mode, right click my stage and select shade smooth. Now it will provide a nice gradient background without any obvious edges. With the background taken care of, let's light the scene. At first I was going to use the famous 3 point light setup. But after some experimentation, I've realized that two lights work just as well. I'm going to slightly rearrange the interface to make sure I have access to my lights properties. And ensure that my rendering engine is set to EV. After that, I'm going to press Z in the camera view and select Rendered. As you can see, the scene went dark because there's no lights in the scene. So let's press Shift A and under Light, select Point. Let's move our point light to just above the plunger and then off to the side along the x-axis. Now under my light settings, I'm going to increase the power to 30, which will result in the plunger being brightly lit on one side and the other one being in shadow. To make that shadow less harsh, I'm going to duplicate the first light, press G for move tool, Shift Z to prevent it from moving up and down, and move it to the other side and slightly behind the plunger. I'm going to increase its power to 90, and its radius to just about under 2 meters. Now the shadows are not as dark, and the handle has this nice rim light around it. So we have our basic lighting figured out, but the scene looks really boring in this dull gray. Let's create materials for the plunger and the background. First I'm going to switch my main viewport to rendered mode and get a good view of the plunger. Then with my plunger selected I'm going to go to the materials tab. Click new to create a new material and rename it to cup. Then in the material properties I will click on base color. I will simply paste the hex value that I have saved but you can use the color wheel above to pick your own color. Now I obviously want to apply a different material to the handle, so I'm going to tab into the edit mode, switch to face select mode, and select the face at the top of the handle. We'll then use control numpad plus to only select handle geometry. With the handle faces selected, I'm going to click on this plus icon to create a new material slot, and then click new to create the material itself. I'm going to name it handle, and click assign to assign it to the selected geometry. Hmm, looks like we missed a few faces at the bottom of the handle. Let me grow my selection by pressing Ctrl Numpad Plus and assign the material to the newly selected faces. Let's give our handle a color that resembles wood. I will copy in the previously picked color, which you can also use, or play with the color wheel to find your own. I will now repeat the same procedure for my light box. But for the light box, I'm also going to remove the specular highlights and increase roughness. 
This will make my light box completely matte. And at this point, I will consider my materials done. We're almost ready to render out our scene. All that's left are a few final tweaks. Let's switch our main viewport back to viewport shading, and under render properties, select cycles as the render engine. While Eevee is a great lightning fast render engine, it does often require more configuration, so the final render of this tutorial will be produced using Cycles. Now as Cycles is rendering in the viewport, I'm noticing that the scene could use some more light, so I'm going to move the left light forward just a tiny bit. I'm also going to increase the brightness of the other light. At this point I'm satisfied with the result and ready to render out the final image. But first I'm going to go to the rendering tab and enable GPU rendering. Since I have a powerful GPU this is going to make my rendering faster. I am also going to enable adaptive sampling and render denoising. Now all that's left is pressing F12 to render out the final image. Depending on your system, it can take a little bit of time, but since we don't have too many objects, lights, and complex shaders, it should not take too long. So here we have it. The only thing that's left is going to the image menu and saving it in the format of your choosing. Actually, we're not quite done yet. After finishing the recording of this tutorial, I realized that the image is still a bit too dull. So I opened it up in Photoshop and dialed up brightness, contrast, and saturation. So here we are at the end of the tutorial. I hope it was useful and easy enough to follow. I will greatly appreciate feedback in the comments. And of course, thank you for watching. See you in the next tutorial.